endings. A conclusion to a book or a movie can be either a fun or a painful experience. The characters we follow throughout their struggles, losses, and wins are nearing the end of their story, and when we turn the last pages of the book or check the leftover time of the movie, we know that there is going to be a time when we're going to have to say goodbye to them. After their story is concluded, we have to let our imaginations do the work to envision their further adventures and lives. Imagine, if you will, being alive in 1983 and watching the final movie of the Star Wars saga, Return of the Jedi. Up until the release of the Expanded Universe books and eventually the prequel trilogy in 1999, there were no further adventures for Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Leia Organa. As a kid, I wasn't aware of the Expanded Universe books, and after my dad took me to see the original trilogy, I would often find myself wondering what other adventures my childhood heroes would get into. Hey there kids, I'm the dadliest man in town. Today, as I was doing my dad things such as finding out that Brooklyn Nine-Nine is not getting another season, I started thinking about a game from my childhood, Alone in the Dark 3. Today, we'll be taking a look at this final part of the original Alone in the Dark trilogy and see what impact it had on the genre. We'll take a look at its development, story, mechanics, and at the end of the video, just like usual, I'll give my own opinion on the game itself, and hopefully by that time, you'll have formed your own opinion as well. We'll be recording Alone in the Dark 3 from DOSBox, as it is currently the best way to play the game in its most original form. Keep in mind that just like the previous two games, the narrative to the game will be mostly explained through the use of in-game items. I'll give you as much explanation throughout the game, kids, but I think the cutscenes pretty much speak for themselves, just like in part two. For now, let's delve into the final part of the original series, with Alone in the Dark 3. With another somewhat success under their belts, Infogram had no reason not to continue work, and Alone in the Dark would become a trilogy. Infogram once again got a team to work on the game and reused Reynal's original engine and tools to keep the series going. The gameplay fundamentals were old, but Infogram took the feedback of Part 2 to heart. They understood that Dark 2 was too focused on action, and for the third part, the decision was made to try and make a balance between both action and the puzzle solving that was less prevalent in the last game. It was up to Infogram to come up with a story for the third time in a new setting. We had pirates, mobsters, so what could be the next logical step? Well, a western setting, of course. Carnby, who in-universe now has established something of a reputation for confronting the paranormal, is called to an Old West ghost town to investigate the disappearance of Emily Hartwood, his co-star of the first episode. He's soon met by a band of zombie cowboy outlaws disturbed by the unwanted presence in their outpost. The biggest change that was made during the development of Dark 3 was in the storage section. Whereas the first two games were distributed on diskettes, Alone in the Dark 3 would be the first game in the series to be shipped out on a CD-ROM instead. This, in turn, opened up a lot of storage for both higher-end artwork and sound usage. Whether these possibilities were actually used was a debatable point, even at the time. Dark 3 is definitely the best-looking and both best-sounding game in the classic series which you can tell from Carnby's intro narration. It sounds a lot less distorted than the audio did in the last games. The tremors took the geological community by surprise. Carnby. Greg Saunders, Hill Century. Cut it short, Greg. I've got problems. You're onto a new case? No, not really, no. I'm alone in the dark. I'll explain some other time. Edward, I got a western that's high and dry in the desert. What, has Billy Silver got a cold? The film crews disappeared. A thousand bucks plus expenses. Five hundred. Eight hundred. Conby, Emily Hartwood's out there. Yeah, your friend, she was part of the crew. Oh, then it's twelve hundred. Okay, have you got a map handy, something to write with? Sure, I got a map and five secretaries at the end of each arm. Go ahead. You see Barstow to the east of L.A.? You go south from there, some 50 miles, then off to the east, about 5 miles. After Las Vegas, go about as far as that black line. You see that on the map? That is the San Andreas Fault. Hey, that's the Mojave Desert out there. Conby, there's a town there. Well, it's not really a town. It's a ghost town, more like. Slaughter Gulch. Okay, I'm your man.
After having gone through the intro, we find our way to the main location of the game, Slaughter Gulch. Since there is no way back, we head over to the bridge. Immediately in the next screen, a cutscene plays where someone throws a stick of dynamite while we're still on the bridge. Carnby jumps off the bridge and dodges the explosion. Guess he doesn't like it as much when he isn't the one causing the senseless carnage like he did in the last game. We find ourselves in the town proper now and head over to the saloon. Right near the entrance is a gas can which we'll pick up before we head inside. In the right corner we'll find an oil can and in the rest of the saloon we'll find a key and a sweet set of maracas. We'll use the projector that's sitting in the middle of the saloon, but unfortunately the generator that powers the machine is out of gas. Luckily, we picked up the gas can in the beginning. We fill up the generator and we're treated to a short movie where we see a ghostly figure entering one of the actors. We move on further into the saloon. In the small room next to the bar, we'll find a matchbox. After this, we'll head behind the bar initially thinking that considering Edward's drinking habits in the last two games, this is the last place we should be at this time. From above, we're attacked by a gunman. We'll stand underneath him in order to dodge his shots, and in time, he'll run out of bullets and walk off. After this, we'll search the shelves and find the most important item in Carmby's inventory for the entire game, hard liquor. Alongside this, we'll find a bottle and some wood alcohol. We'll throw the bottle and find a token inside, which we can use to operate another machine, which will give us some more insight into the history of Slaughter Gulch. That bull skull on the wall looked at us funny, so we'll push one of the horns down, which will open a trapdoor and reveal another gunman popping out. After he runs out of bullets and heads towards us, it'll give us a chance to unleash a flurry of fisticuffs on the villain until we take him down. The enemy leaves us with a gold bullet and an ace of diamonds card, which we'll pick up before we head down the trapdoor. Once we fall down, we are alone in the dark. Yes kids, pun is intended. We fill up the lamp with the oil we found in the saloon and light it with the matches we picked up earlier. We finally have some sight now, and we find ourselves in the saloon's cellar. At the opposite side of the room, we'll find a poster with a clue which tells us which barrel we need to pass through to get out of here. We open said barrel and our path is blocked by snakes. We'll use the maracas which lure the snakes out and we pass through the barrel, using the ladder at the end to make our way up. This puts us in a cell. An enemy pops up from the path we came from and we take care of it by punching. What else? Inside the cell, we find a stone lying on the bed. We'll take it along with us and head out of the cell. Making our way to the end of the corridor, we end up in a room with a drunk henchman. While we could kill him easily, we'll put down the bottle of wood alcohol in front of him. He'll drink it and, of course, die of natural causes, leaving us with a flask. After this, we'll head to the small entryway a little bit back and... Joke's on you kids, obviously we need to throw the rock as it will contain an Indian amulet, because rocks do. We need this to cross the quarter as the sigil on the floor will kill us otherwise. I mean, of course it would. We enter the sheriff's room and use the key to open up the gun cabinet. Inside we'll find a Winchester. On the other side of the room we'll find a sheriff's badge and some Winchester bullets. There are three posters on the wall which we can read through. They contain hints on the enemies that we're most likely going to be encountering later on in the game. After we're done reading them, we'll exit the room and head over to the main hall. In the main hall, we'll see a wardrobe, a large door, and a rope ladder. Remember the last time we had a large wardrobe and an opening in part 1? We're not going to be taking any chances here, so we'll shove the wardrobe in front of the door before enemies are going to jump through it. Before we head up the rope ladder, we'll open the wardrobe and pick up the shotgun we find inside. Now, we can finally make our way upstairs. When we get to the next section, we'll find a whip, which we'll pick up before moving onward. We find this UFO or something shooting down beams of light. 
The beams will kill us if they touch us, and there's an item underneath it that we'll need later on. After we get the hangman's rope from underneath the UFO, we'll continue until we find a door. In front of it is a cast iron plate, which we'll pick up and equip. We'll leave the door as is and continue following the path until we reach the next area, where we'll find a cartridge belt and a single enemy. This is the Lone Miner, one of the enemies which we saw from the posters in the room where we found the Winchester. If you remember the info on the poster, it seems like he's so greedy that the only thing that would kill him is a gold bullet. Luckily, we found such a gold bullet from the enemy we beat in the saloon. We load up the Winchester with a bullet and shoot the lone miner, killing him. When he dies, he drops a bag of scorpions. We'll need this for later, so we'll pick these up. In the next room, we'll find a Gatling gun and a flask for some much needed intoxication for Carby. Now, we'll need to head back to the door we didn't enter earlier. We can't open it normally as we need to load up the Winchester and shoot the door for some reason, opening it in the process. As we go inside and light up the lamp to see, we'll be met with a hangman who uses voodoo to try and suffocate us. Shooting him doesn't do us any good, but if we use the hangman's rope, he won't be able to attack anymore as he'll fall down the trap door. However, Edward Murder Boner Carnby wouldn't be the lovable psychopath we all know if he would let this guy off that easily. We walk over to the opening from the trap door and drop in the bag of scorpions, leaving the enemy at the bottom probably to die a slow, gruesome death. Now you know that this game actually predates the ESRB rating system. Now that we've sated Edward's murder cravings, we use the lever to close the trap door and find a dynamite stick and some dried meat on the other side. We'll head outside of the hangman's room and return to where we encountered the lone miner. Here, we'll be assailed by two henchmen. We take care of them with the Winchester and head back to the room where we picked up the Gatling gun. There's a door here, and someone behind it is trying to fire blindly in an effort to hit us. However, we dodge their shots by hiding behind the wall next to the door. As soon as they're done, we'll head back to the crack in the wall to the side where we find a short fuse. We'll use the dynamite and place it inside the crack. After a few seconds, the wall will be blown up, which will create an opening for us to pass through. The next room will have a towel on the floor, which we'll step on, which opens a door to the side. We'll move through the tight corridors until we find another goon, which we'll have to kill. After this, we'll move just a bit further and end up at a strange machine embedded in the wall. The machine won't run unless we use the sheriff's badge on it to replace the missing gear. After this, we'll have to whip it to turn the handle on top of it. These sick moves open the door where we fought off the goon earlier. We'll head inside and pick up the flask in the door, downing it so Carnby can keep the demons from getting out. On the plank in the room's opening, we'll pick up some Winchester bullets before taking a few steps back and doing a badass Die Hard-esque move to jump through the window. Further down the hallway we find ourselves in, we'll see Emily, walking in a zombie-like state. The candle holder to the right hides a costume ring, which we'll pick up before we try to make our way out of there. We head back and use the matches to light up the right candle, which will make a ghost appear in front of us. We light up the left one as well, which will open the door. When we head through the door into the next room, we'll find a newspaper sheet on the floor, which will give us some information about the kid who returns to the place where he was murdered when he hears the vulture's song. Of course, the clock in the room turns out to be a vulture clock, and imagine my surprise when the kid shows up exactly in the room where we found the newspaper article. This is where we can use the piece of dried meat that we found back in the hangman's room. We'll place the meat on the clock, which will make the vulture stop doing what he's doing and force the kid to jump into the picture where he will no longer pose a threat to us. After this, we'll walk through the painting and into the next room. Before we head on though, we pick up the night valet in the room. After this, we'll head further through the building until we reach a room where we'll search and find a bullet 
a pearl, and a bulb. We'll use the push command, which will turn the mirror of the dresser, and we'll find a key behind it. And when we check the pouch on the female statue near the bed, we'll get our grubby little hands on an arrow. When we place the arrow on the bow of the Cupid-like statue, we'll open the door to the main hallway. We'll head back there and use the key we found behind the mirror to open the door. In this room, we'll find a dragon statuette that's missing an eye. Luckily, we might have just the thing. With the costume ring we picked up after Carnby reenacted the scene from Die Hard by jumping through the window. We take out the diamond and place it inside the statuette's eye socket, which rewards us with a box of Winchester bullets. After this, we'll head on to the balcony. There's a bit of flooring that looks off in comparison to the rest. An enemy will shoot us through the door as soon as we walk onto it. Therefore, let's give him a target to shoot, shall we? We place the night valet onto the floor and the henchman will shoot it a few times. After this, he'll walk outside and fall to his doom as the floorboard apparently can't handle his brass balls thinking he can take on Edward Carnby. Next to the door the henchman came out of is a loose shutter. We'll push that to make a makeshift bridge for ourselves. We'll cross it and enter the room on the other side, grabbing a key, a shutter release, the flash, and an instruction sheet from said room. After this, we'll head back onto the balcony and through the hallway where we came in. We'll open the other room with the key we picked up where we'll encounter a two-headed monster. This monster reminds me of the bathtub beast of the first game, whereas it cannot move, so if we stay away from it, we should be safe. Luckily for us, this one isn't invincible, and we kill it by combining the flash with the bulb we picked up earlier, along with the shutter release. This flashes the monster into the shadow realm, making the room safe to go through. We'll pick up a can of oil from the room, which will fill up the lamp, and after this we will hit the red target on the wall, granting us a war stick and another flask. Having done that, we'll use the token we got after we beat the kid and put it into the harpsichord, which gives us a bit of story. After we're done with all of that, we go through the open shaft in the room to the next area. As soon as we light the lamp, we're set upon by bats. There is no use fighting them, so the best way out is to head towards the next area. The room brings us to a jumping puzzle that is eerily familiar to the one at the end of the original game. The jump command is back and we'll make our way from pillar to pillar until we eventually meet an Indian shaman. We show him the war stick and he'll move to the side, our new friend granting us a small key and some Winchester bullets along the way. There's a small puzzle which makes the blocks rise every time we jump on one but eventually we'll encounter a dead end. To get around this, we'll use the Indian amulet, which summons our shaman buddy and allows us to cross the gap. The pillar we land on will rise up, taking us along with it. Now we end up in a building, a ninja cowboy henchman throwing stars at us along with one of his buddies wearing a top hat. We take care of them the only way Carnby knows, which is cold-blooded murder. After we get off of our rampage high, we'll find a top hat, a flask, and a key. We'll use the key to open one of the doors and move into the room with a few bookcases. If we search through the cases, we'll find some books which contain some lore. Also in the room, we'll find a printing plate and a statuette which we can search to get a pocket watch. We can use the printing plate on the printing press to receive a newspaper article for some more lore. One of the books that we find in the cabinet, a white book, can only be read after we light the candle. We'll do just that and get a cryptic message which will hint on some of the events yet to come. When the full moon is reflected through the symbol of Prext, an honest man's movements are slowed until he breaks the cursed glass. He who places the war stick of Thunder Sun at the center of the Stone of the Dead will rend the sky and hold off forever those who guard the sticks.
The message mentions Pregst, the main baddie from the original game. We'll head out of the room and head to the door on the other side of the hallway. We can open this one by using the pocket watch. Inside the room, we'll find a character by the name of Morrison. He's scared that we're here to hurt him, but if we walk up to him, he'll give us a storyboard and trust us enough that he'll stand guard at the door while we work out what's in the room. There's a bust in the room which we'll put the top hat on. After this, two ghouls will show up, one of them opening the curtains, which reveals a stained glass window with the image of Ezekiel Pregs, which slows down our movement. The other ghoul kills Morrison, bringing his short time during our adventure to an end. We'll kill the ghoul who ended Morrison's life as payback for our friend's death. However, we can still only move slowly, and it's getting annoying. We stand in front of the stained window and grab our trusty Winchester, firing it at the damn thing and shattering it to pieces, ending Preg's curse. Next, we'll walk out the stairs and jump through the window, ending up in the cemetery. It's quiet, too quiet for our tastes, and eventually, two undertakers will rise up from their graves. Fighting them off would be too much of a hassle, so we'll take the hint from the white book and place the war stick in the circular pedestal in the middle of the cemetery. This kills the two undertakers, giving us the chance to explore the area freely. We'll find a grave further down the area containing the letters O-E-J and use the Ace of Diamonds to open it up giving us a message from our old nemesis, One-Eyed Jack, from Alone in the Dark 2, before we move up towards a new floor. A new room and new things to find, kids. In this room, we'll pick up the oil can, a roll of film, and a bag of pemmican. We'll head over to the fireplace and find out that there's a mechanism that's a bit stiff. Seeing as it's one of the top things to throw into a fireplace, we'll use the can of oil to lube up the mechanism. This, in turn, makes it so that the wall goes up, giving us access to the ballroom. In the ballroom, we'll find two statues, one of a man and one of a woman. Searching the man gives us a hammer, while the woman rewards us with another bag of Winchester bullets. Having gathered more of an arsenal than Rambo at this time, we'll continue through the ballroom until we see a band playing further ahead. We'll head towards the band, the guitarist shooting at us a few times before the music stalls, effectively rendering them harmless. This gives us the chance to search the gramophone on the right side, giving us a guitar string, a musical score, and a safe key. When we get the items, the small enemy on the side will start to focus on us, we kill him and make our way back out, dodging the spinning enemy since he can't get out of the room. We're now back in the room with the fireplace, where there is a hidden passage on the left side. Making our way through the door, we find ourselves inside a hallway with a door just opposite the one we just came out of. Unfortunately, it's locked, yet no key that we have will open this door. Luckily, Carnby knows his way around locks. We take the 3030 bullet we picked up earlier in the game and shove it into the lock. After, we'll use the hammer to hit the bullet, blowing up the lock and opening the door for us. After we make our way inside the new room, we'll head towards the end, where we find a small train station model. In it, we'll find a light bulb, a blasting cap, and a map. On the other side of the room, we'll find a mounting table. Apparently, the table isn't in the best state but we can fix it with a bit of string. After this, we'll put the light bulb into the machine and watch a small film of Jed Stone apparently doing some sort of ritual to Emily. Once the film is done, we'll use the musical score which shows the numbers 806, a combination which will probably come in handy later. We're done here for now, so we'll head through the door and find ourselves in the bank. We'll pick up the book on the table for some more lore and head towards the picture at the end of the room. We open it up, finding that there is a code entry device inside. The code will switch every time we'll use it, so we'll continue using it until we hit the numbers 806. Now, the way inside the bank is safe, as I found out earlier that if you went into the back without entering the code, a security system would go off killing us instantly. 
We'll head into the other side of the room and reach the safe door. In order to open it, we'll need both the pearl and the safe key. The door opens and the bank clerk comes out, stealing our Indian amulet off of us before he slowly tries to bamf his way out of the room. Edward, seething with rage after this man's disrespect, proceeds to murder him in ways that I can't describe in words without setting off some form of content warnings on YouTube. So let's just say we beat the heck out of him and take back the amulet. After showing the bank clerk our alpha male ways, we take a suitcase of money from the safe along with some more Winchester bullets before we head towards the window near the safe and open it. This will allow us to climb out of the window and meet another person who apparently isn't there to kill us. He gives us a message and we'll take it, alongside a detonator box, some bullets, and the flask in the room before we head into the minecart, our burly friend letting it loose before we shoot across the tracks, dodging bullets from the henchmen who take shots at us as we pass by. Our Disney minecart ride ended us up at the station. There's a strange character on top of the building who's whistling for help, making enemies spawn into the building. We fight them off, and then push the sign that says station on the side. For some reason, when the paint bucket falls into the station sign, the character on top won't whistle for any more help and will simply wallow in his misery. Dropping the paint bucket also gives us the key to the suitcase, which we'll pick up. Now, we need to get out of here. The only door we can exit through is blocked off, and we need to ring the station bell to have the mechanism open the door for us. We'll search the station bench and find an eye bolt, which we can use to ring the bell. The door opens slowly at first, but it'll go into a fast pattern after this. If we touch the door, we'll die, so we'll try to get out of it when it goes up slowly. We're now outside, and Carmby has had it with this station house. We put the blasting cap just to the side of the building and then use the detonator, blowing the station up. Next, we'll head over to the opposite side of the station's remains where we'll find Jed and Emily on the top of a water tower. Jed wants us to put down the suitcase and the key for Emily's safe return. We do so, but Jed wouldn't be much of a villain if this were the end of the story. Instead, we get shot and Carnby after three grueling games, finally meets his match. But hold on, the Indian amulet is actually a hashtag life hack, which brings us back to life. Unfortunately, because the shaman who made this thing has obviously never seen Full Metal Alchemist and heard about the laws of equal exchange, it brings us back into the shape of a cougar. Obviously, we can't retain this feline form for the rest of the game. So our shaman friend instructs us to find a golden eagle, which will help us turn human again. We run out of the cave and head towards the first area of the game. We enter the saloon and use our cat-like reflexes to jump up the stairs. After this, we jump the hole near where we found the costume ring and jump out of the window that we jumped into earlier in the game. After this, we make our way through the small corridors once more until we end up at a statue. We jump and land on top of the statue, the hand concealing the golden eagle that we need for our mission. We jump off and head into the building. Behind it, we'll find a barrel which contains tar. We dip our paw into it and head off into the town once more. During our approach, the moon shows up, revealing some werewolves have entered the scene. We'll head into the buildings to the side and find another barrel, this time containing silver dust. Luckily for us, werewolves hate silver as the legends go, so we'll fight off the beast using our new weapon. After we take care of both of them, we'll head back towards the cemetery and make our way to the place we were resurrected in. We drop the golden eagle into the glowing spot and switch scenes to where some henchmen are burying Carnby's body. After pulling a literal Dawn of the Dead move on them, they run off in fear. As they should, Carmby's rage at this point is second only to the Doomslayer and he's ready to rip and tear them a new one. We head back to the water tower and find a ghoul form of Carnby. Fighting it is no use, as it'll both shoot and punch faster than us and we just fight ourselves to death. 
Instead, we're going to try something we've never done before. Pacifism. We drop the gun on the ground and head towards the ghoul. This makes us merge, giving Carnby a sweet new cowboy costume. After this... event? We make our way up to the water tower and jump inside it. Normally, you'd be able to kill the enemy inside by giving him a bar of soap you'd find behind your grave. Unfortunately, I forgot about this, kids, so we'll have to finish him off the old-fashioned way. He drops a metallic brush, which fits perfectly into a mechanism inside the tower. When we use it, it opens a trap door inside, which we'll jump into. We now find ourselves in a hallway. Inside this place, we'll find a small bust, which looks off in comparison to the rest. Also inside the room is a dead leaf. We'll pick this up and use it on the bust. This will open up the door towards the next area. There's one big thug in the next room and another one in the one after that. They're no joke, and I don't want to count the times I died to them both during this gameplay and the one when I was younger. After we fight them off, we'll grab a pickaxe from the opening in the wall and head off on our next quest. I'm sorry, did I say quest? I meant puzzle kids. We'll have an invisible block puzzle in front of us. The path is fairly easy and isn't randomly generated, so with a few tries we get the sequence down and make it to the other side. Our path is blocked off by a guard. Luckily, we can use the pickaxe to bash him to death, opening our path towards the next area. In this room, there's yet another enemy. The pickaxe will break after a few uses, but we have no other weapons worth a damn, so the only choice we have is to use the leftover stick to beat him with. When he dies, we're free to explore the area to the left, where we find a water pitcher. And where the last enemy got up, we'll find a book. The door is locked, but we find a needle when we walk close to it. If we go back to where we found the water pitcher and search the pillar, we'll find a candlestick, which will open the path to the next room. Inside of it is a hallway that's closed off with a miniature standing right in front of the wall. We take the water pitcher we found in the last room and pour it onto the statuette. This will force it to change color and open the doorway so we can continue. We now find ourselves inside of an elevator. Inside, we'll find a small piggy bank. It won't be in our possession for long, because Carnby's got debts to pay, and piggy banks contain money so we throw that sucker against the wall. Unfortunately, the only thing we find inside is a microscope glass plate. It looks like Carnby's pay will have to wait for another day. We turn the lever and come to yet another hallway, this one containing four colored sections on the wall. In the distance, there's a microscope. We'll use the glass plate we found in the elevator and take a gander at what's inside. It shows us four colored blots. No doubt the combination in which we need to interact with the four colored wall parts. We'll press the sequence white, green, blue, and red, and we'll make our way towards the last section of the game. We find ourselves in a laboratory this time. Towards the wall is a table, which contains a vial of poison. We can use the poison on the needle to create a poisoned needle. After this, we'll head towards the other side of the room, where there's a doctor behind iron bars. We'll take the poison needle with us and then head to the distilling coil near the cell. When we use the poison there, it won't kill us, but rather shrink us, allowing us to pass through the bars. It seems like the doctor is up for some of his own medicine. We equip the needle and punch him, killing him immediately. He leaves us with a straw, a key, and a bottle of ammonia. We use the key to open the cell and subsequently use the distilling coil again to shrink ourselves once more. This allows us to pass underneath the table, where there's a small passage. We equip the straw and run towards the small crevasse, using the straw to vault over it. On the other side, we find a vial of potion. We need to hurry and get out of here, though since the potion only lasts a few seconds after this. We make our way through the passage and find... the stuff of my goddamn nightmares. 
we run over to the glowing thing to the left, since apparently that's the Abomination's food supply, and pour the vial of potion over it. The beast ignores us and eats, shrinking it down to a harmless size. Of course, there's only one way to assure it's harmless, and that is to squish it beneath our boot. After we're done killing what was probably the only creature of its kind, we head towards the spider's web and pick up the pot of glue. Next to where we found the creature is an opening, and we can use the pot of glue to climb up the wall towards our next destination. As soon as we make it up, we're set upon by a headless figure. His head is apparently on the cabinet across from us, so we grab it and throw it down the hole, forcing the thing to jump after it. After this, we can search the room, where we find a lead ingot on a boulder. We push the boulder aside and grab ourselves a flask and a good old Winchester. We're done in this room, so we'll head on to the next one, where we face the enemy called Cobra. He reminds me of the jumping enemy from part 2, so we didn't waste too much time with strategies and just pumped him full of lead immediately. His death leaves us with a wig and a silver dollar which we'll pick up along with the other flask that's hidden in the corner of the room. To the left, where we first saw Cobra, is a painting of Jed. We'll use the silver dollar on it, which will open the door, and head down the ladder to a small room where we find a matchbox. Once we pass through the door, Jed will run like the coward he is. We still need to save Emily, though. We'll head up to the crucible and put the lead ingot into it before lighting it up with matches. This will melt the ingot and set Emily free while at the same time producing the evil staff. We'll need this later, so we'll pick it up and keep it safe. Emily is out for the count, so we'll head for the room that Jed ran off to. As soon as we're in, the door will close and a spike platform will head towards us. An enemy is upon us at the same time and we have to fight it off in order to survive. We take its knife after it dies. When we finally kill it, the wall is still on its way towards us. We'll have to take a step back and throw the bottle of ammonia at the door. This, in turn, will wake up Emily, who will flip the switch which pulls back the spiked wall. There's no turning back now. We're on our way to the final battle. The door at the end is closed. We'll use Cobra's wig on the chains near the top of the door to activate the mechanism, and during this we'll see Jed putting on power armor? Okay, so we run in for the final showdown. We're not just facing Jed, we're also facing the Elwood brothers. We run towards the arches and head into the room with the totem. We place the evil staff in the totem, which will make the Elwood brothers disappear. This leaves us with just Jed. We run past him and head towards the reservoir, turning the faucet on. Next to the faucet, we'll find a rubber glove, which we'll put on immediately. We then use the knife to cut the electric wires before dropping them into the water. After this, we head back to the totem room and wait until Jed, for some reason, steps into the water, electrocuting himself. This takes care of the final enemy. Emily will open up the door for us and tell us to come with her. We pick up the bag of coal on our way out and head towards the train that Emily is on. Finally, we put the coal in the furnace and light it with the matches before pushing the lever on the right. This ends our stint in Alone in the Dark 3. Well kids, that was it. The final part in the Alone in the Dark classic series. Playing these games again was a blast, and it gave me a good insight of the influences that the series brought to other games such as Shinji Mikami's Resident Evil with the game's fixed camera angles. Dark 3 was definitely the best looking and sounding entry to the series, just like I mentioned before, but I feel that if Infogum wasn't focused on reusing Renal's original engine, they could have gotten more out of the game than they did. The game was good, but when you're comparing the 90s gaming landscape at the time, I understand that even though the game received mixed reviews, which means it wasn't all doom and gloom, it was eventually, probably, drowned out by the games releasing that year such as Doom 2, Warcraft, and the original Elder Scrolls game Arena. 
you'd have to understand the landscape here, kids. Like I said in the last video, games and especially graphics were developing at an incredible speed at the time. Nintendo and Sega were involved in the bit wars where graphic fidelity and speed were the focus. And here, a game series where its third part only showed a slight increase in graphical quality with minor changes in gameplay, it just wasn't enough innovation to keep the series relevant. Still, Alone in the Dark 3 is a classic, and I'll remember it fondly. Looking back at the trilogy though, the original game definitely takes first place for me. Its focus on puzzles and storyline and minimal combat if you chose to was a perfect mix for me, and even though graphically it, let's be fair, has not aged well and getting Carmi to run is still the stuff of nightmares, it just clicks with me. Maybe you agree with me, and maybe you don't. I'd love to know your thoughts, so definitely let me know in the comments. If you have a specific game or series that you'd like me to review, hit me up in the comments as well and I'll see if I have it lying around in my library somewhere. If you enjoyed this video, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. You don't have to, but it'd mean the world to me if you did. As for now, I'm going to leave the original Alone in the Dark trilogy behind us and focus on other games that I can show you all. What can I tell you about the next one? All I can say, it's timeless. See you next time, kids. Take care.